Hello and welcome to the RAST Network. What you're about to hear and see is limited to general financial information only. Please be sure to speak to your financial planner or refer to our financial services guide available at rask.com.au slash FSG before acting on the information. Kate Campbell, welcome to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast. It is good to be back, Owen. It is good to be back. We've got our Axel Coffees. We're sitting in the studio here in Melbourne and we're going to muse on 10 years of ETF investing, Kate. Yes. Well, between us, it's a lot more than 10 years, but I thought I would avoid clickbait and just do the longest length of time between the two of us. Okay. Yeah. Um, investing, huh? And in ETFs. ETFs have come a long way. Maybe we should just start for anyone that we fear might get left behind. Really quick, what is an ETF? An ETF is basically a basket of investments. So instead of going and saying, I want to buy a Commonwealth Bank or I want to buy Cochlear or I want to buy BHP, I can say, I want to buy all of the large Australian listed companies and I can buy an ETF like A200 that invests in all of the top 200 ETFs. Easy peasy. So you just make a, instead of buying an individual share in your brokerage account, you can buy an ETF and you can get a bit of everything. Yeah, and we love them because they instantly diversify us. So instead of having all of our money in one company, we're invested in hundreds of companies. If we're investing in the US, it might be thousands of companies. And there's hundreds of ETFs now that offer everything you could want for your portfolio. So instead of having to buy 20 or 30 different investments, we can just buy a handful and build our portfolio like that with ETFs. Yeah, cool. So if anyone's ever seen a pie chart of a financial portfolio, like someone's portfolio. Well, they're super fund website. They're super fund, yeah. You can basically have each slice of that pie as a different ETF. One of the things to keep in mind, as Kate just alluded to, is that it doesn't have to just be shares. You can have ETFs that invest in bonds, which are like from the government, they have contracts, uh, produce income. You can have an ETF that invests in gold. There's ETFs now that invest in Bitcoin. There are ETFs that invest in all different types of things. You can even get ETFs of ETFs. Uh, if you want to stack them on top of each other, so to speak, you can do that too. And in fact, there are now around about 340 different ETFs in Australia. One of the common misconceptions about ETFs, and this is something that will be made more apparent over the next five years, I believe, is that not all ETFs are index funds. People think that they're the same thing. They are not. An ETF is just a wrapper. So it's like the box of favorites. It's the favorites box. It's not what's inside. What's inside is the strategy or what you're investing in. And um, that can be anything. It could be a cherry ripe. It could be a picnic. It could be whatever chocolate you like is inside. So you just got to pay attention because it might not even be chocolate in there. It might not be an index fund. It might be an active ETF. So where an individual human is making decisions over what goes in the portfolio. A really common example of that would be something like uh, the FMEX ETF, which is an ETF that we own. I shouldn't say ETF. It's an active ETF. Uh, it's a fund, if you will. Um, we have that inside our portfolios, Kate. But then there are other things, like you mentioned BetaShares A200. Full disclosure, BetaShares is a sponsor of this show. Um, A200 is an ETF that just invests in the top 200 or biggest 200 Australian shares. So there's basically an ETF for everything, but they're not all index funds. No. So, I mean, when I started my investing journey, I didn't know what an ETF was. I actually started with individual companies not really knowing what I was doing. I certainly helped the broker make a lot of money because you have to buy, um, every time you buy and sell, you pay a fee. So I was making the broker a lot of money, but not myself much money. Mm. And it wasn't until I went a little bit further on my journey that I discovered other types of investment options were available. And that's how I discovered ETFs and how I could use them to fill the bulk of my portfolio. So I still invest in some individual companies. I invest in super, I invest in a managed fund, have property, but most of my investments are in ETFs now. Yeah. Is that the same for you? Yeah, yeah. Basically all of it now. Um, and with the launch of our Rask Invest service, basically that's what I'll do every month is some of my income will just automatically go there via BPay or direct deposit straight into our managed portfolios. And yeah, that's that's all I need to do nowadays. I still will, I imagine the next few years, buy some individual shares. Uh, I wrote an email not too long ago, Kate, that talked about where I'm invested and why and how it's changed over the years. And in the early days, I was much like yourself, started off with individual shares. I've, see, I worked at The Motley Fool. 
Um, then you I decided worked, to make investing in your career. Yes, absolutely. Then I moved to a company called Zenith here in Melbourne for just a very brief while, which gave me some insight into managed funds and how financial advisors research uh, ETFs and those types of things. Uh, and then started Rask, obviously, and it's gone on since then. But basically, I've had exposure to both sides of that world. So you've got like the direct stocks, uh, and then you've got like the, the the managed funds or the ETFs. They're kind of the same thing. It's just the way you access them, just with that wrapper. And so we've seen the ETF industry in Australia really blossom over the past 10 years. And I think one of the benefits for us at Rask and for you and I and just anyone of this kind of generation of investor is that you've been able to see the growth of ETFs uh, from the earliest days because they, ha even though they've only been around a few decades, which isn't that long, in Australia, they haven't really established themselves until probably the past five to 10 years. The first uh, ETF in Australia was the STW ETF from Spider, um, Spider SPDR, for those of you that have seen it. Uh, it's just an ASX 200, just what you see on the news every day is what you get. Um, that was one of the first, or was the first here, I believe. And then gold, G-O-L-D, which is from GlobalX, which was previously uh, ETF Securities. I believe that was one of or the first gold ETFs in the world. So that one just, you put your money into it in your brokerage account, like Perla or Self-Wealth or Comsec or whatever your stake or whatever you're using. You put your money into it and then they go and buy the gold bars and it sits in a vault. Um and that one's that one was created by a guy called Graham Tuckwell. And this is just an Australian example, but he also had um invest in ETFs that he started overseas as well. And so that was he was like the pioneer of that. Um and it's been really interesting to see how we've grown since then. I just pulled up some numbers from the ASX. I think over the last 12 months, I could be mistaken about this. I don't know if exactly what it was trying to measure here. Um, but it basically has this, it says the average 12 month, the tr sorry, the 12 month average transactions, 611,000 in February, 2024, meaning that I believe as of February, 2024, the average monthly transactions was 611,000. So- In ETFs? In ETFs, they call them, they, the ASX calls them ETPs. The reason why they call them exchange traded products is because a few years ago, they realized that people were getting confused between ETFs and index funds and ETFs and managed funds. Um, and so they introduced this idea of ETPs, which covers everything. So ETFs would be part of that. So would the thing that I mentioned earlier on, which was FEMEX, F-M-E-X is a ticker symbol. REITs? R REITs, they're separate. They're a separate type of thing because they're just a standard trust. Um, so what we've seen, particularly since COVID, I think the ETF market in Australia, I think since COVID has... It's doubled. I don't know if it's even done more than that. And that's that. That's in terms of the amount of money that's invested in them. I remember my first ETF was actually on my mother's behalf because I remember thinking to myself, uh, "I'm I'm okay at you know picking individual companies, and I was doing pretty well. I was obviously working the multi full. I was thinking I'm doing you know I'm okay with this sort of stock stuff, but for my mum, I don't want to take that risk. So I saw the rise of ETFs, and I was thinking, if something was to happen to me. Or our relationship, frankly, not that it would, but if something was to happen, at least she'd be okay in an ETF. She might not shoot the lights out, so to speak, but at least I know she's diversified. It's a good ETF. It's from a bigish, like big product provider, like uh, I think it was iShares or BlackRock. Um, so I knew that she would be okay mm. in that ETF, and that was really my first exposure to ETFs, and that was a long time ago. What do you remember? What the first time you invested in an ETF, or what it was? I don't think I invested in that many ETFs before I started using a robo advisor. And right. that would have been six years ago, maybe. Before that, I was individual shares and an international managed fund, which was my first longer term investment, which I've mentioned on the show before. But I used a robo advisor at the beginning to create the portfolio for me. I was pretty busy, I didn't have the time to manage it. Myself, So I got someone else to design the portfolio, build it, and then I could add money to my account each month. And once it hit a certain point, it got automatically invested for me. Yeah. That's interesting. So the robo-advisor basically sits between you and the ETFs. They pick the, yeah. the ETFs for you. Um, interestingly, as of February 2024, this is when the latest ASX data is out, <clears throat> um, the average size of money going into ETFs is $9.7 Think about that amount of money. So when you invest two grand a month, 
there's a lot of money following you into the ETF market in Australia. And that's because now more than ever, financial advisors are using ETFs. Super funds are. Super funds. Like anyone can use an ETF these days. And it's great because it's really democratized what it means to invest. And, you know, in the early days, as I said, most of the ETFs, apart from that gold ETF, uh, were index funds. So you get like the ASX 200 ETF. There's two of those actually, uh, believe it or not. Uh, there's the IOZ ETF. And then there's the ASX 200, which is the STW ETF. They basically do exactly the same thing. And then you've got the BetaShares A200 ETF, which doesn't use the ASX 200, but uses basically the identical number of shares and all that sort of stuff. And there's been heaps of those come out. And then what we saw not too long ago, maybe a few years ago, we saw more commodity ETFs, probably five to 10 years ago. About five years ago, we started to see more of these thematic ETFs. So ETFs like Hack, which is a cybersecurity ETF from BetaShares. We saw ACDC, which is a thematic ETF that focuses on like renewable energy and battery storage and stuff like that. Sorry, more battery storage from GlobalX. And we started to see these thematic ETFs come out. Uh, and we also are now starting to see more sector-based ETFs come out, which is just basically the same thing, except not trying to capture a theme, but more just give people a slither of a market like healthcare or food. Food, is F-O-O-D is one from BitShares. Um, and then even now, more and more recently, like in the last couple of years, what we've seen is really niche ETFs come out. So we're starting to see ETFs that, uh, for example, might give you the, the NASDAQ, but instead of giving you the NASDAQ 100, they give you like the NASDAQ 200 or the things that people don't really normally invest in. And we're starting to see some ETFs come into Australia that are like experiments basically. So they're ETFs that um, like a financial advisor might say, oh, I'd really like an ETF that did blah. And then someone can turn that into an ETF, right? And so we're starting to see more of those and we're starting to see, and my prediction is we'll see a lot more of them is active ETFs. So we'll see a lot more fund managers who are picking individual stocks and doing that type of a thing. I reckon we'll see hundreds of them over the next three or four years, hundreds. It's the challenge, isn't it? Because once you've released your core suite of ETFs and you've got the basics covered, if you want to stay relevant, you'd have to keep releasing new themes and new sectors and finding new ways to create products for people. Yeah. And if you think about it from an ETF provider's perspective, so like a Vanguard, uh, VanEck, uh, BlackRock I mentioned or iShares, GlobalX, BetaShares. If you think about it from their perspective, if they're already established as one of the big six, and there's about six big ones, um, what do they have left to do? What they've got left is kind of like the niche types of strategies. Maybe they could, in, like a lot of them have moved into investment platforms. So BetaShares is BetaShares Direct now, it's, which is coming to market in a big way. Vanguard has their Vanguard own Vanguard has personal investor services. Um, well, they're moving into superannuation. Yeah, and we saw the owner of um, we saw the owner of Globalex, which is a company called Marae. They bought a big stake of Stockspot, which is a robot advice platform. So you're seeing a lot of these ETF providers. They're really big and they're really well established and dominant. And they're thinking, well, how else can we help investors? Um, and they've got the ability to do it because they're established, right? And so don't be surprised to see more of that in the future. Um, and I think if we look forward 10 years, there's probably something else that might come to Australia, which people aren't familiar with, Kate, which is uh, something called direct indexing. I get a lot of emails about these things. Um, so direct indexing is like, we've spoken about it before, but uh, let's say, let's go back to my mother's portfolio example when I bought her first ETF, which is the iShares Global Healthcare ETF way back in the day. She did pretty well out of it, by the way. Thank you very much. Um, that one has healthcare stocks in it. But imagine she wanted healthcare stocks, but she didn't want genetics in there for whatever reason. She had an ethical dilemma or whatever. Direct indexing is basically this idea where you could go in and you could be like, I want that ETF, but I don't want those genetics companies. It's basically like going to build a bear for your ETF. Build a bear. Yeah, that makes sense. Or if you're... Um, if you go to the pub and normally you just get like the bottle of Coke, you can actually get a post-mix or a pre-mix. So you can, instead of grabbing the can of Coke, that seems pretty good, you could tweak the flavors for your own needs. And you could do the same thing with your investing. You could say, I only want companies that pay dividends that aren't in mining. Or I only want companies that have long-term growth track records with founders still there. So you could do things like that and you could kind of build your own, as you said. Yeah, making it really customizable. Yeah, I'm not convinced that 
we need that, to be honest, because that's just stock picking. Um, but so I don't think that we need it, but um, that is one way this world could go. Mm. And taking everything you've just said, I would probably offer another point, which is my first reflection that I wanted to share today is that investing actually can be quite simple. So we've mentioned a lot of different products and innovations and things that might be coming on the horizon, but investing can be simple. In fact, simple actually works best for many investors and something that we've both learnt working in the finance industry and behind the scenes at different investment companies is often things are made to seem more complicated to sell them yeah, yeah. or to make more money. And so as an investor, you don't need a super complicated strategy. We've both simplified our own investment strategies over the years. We've tried everything and we've simplified substantially. Mm. And that's been a process of elimination and figuring out what our own plan is, working out what our goals are. And our goals have changed over time and that's changed our plans. But keeping things simple, you don't need to get overwhelmed. It can feel like there's a lot going on at the start, but if you try and think, how can I simplify everything I'm taking in and find a, a straightforward path? Yeah, and it is. You're right. Like that's what ETFs have done wonderfully. And mm. the but first, they've gotten to the point where they're complicating things. Yeah, again. they could be going back the other way. And I think that's what's happened with if you look at brokerage platforms as well, like all the brokerage platforms, you log into it, it's like you're sitting in, you know, a, a Qantas. A380 cockpit and you're trying to figure out what all the buttons mean. Yeah, like the new fintech brokerage platforms, when they very first launched three, four, five years ago, they were really simple. Yeah. And now they're adding and they more worked. and more features and different gimmicks and memberships and it's getting more complicated and overwhelming for the new investor. Yeah, absolutely it is. And that's always the way they go because they try and charge fees. Like all of those platforms didn't start with the right ethos. Um and I think that's actually something that we've seen in the brokerage platforms as well, is you can log into some brokers and they'll offer you 50,000 different things to invest in. Um, you've impressed upon me that people don't really need more than three choices before they become confused. Uh, and that's the same for investing. And I think that when it comes to ETFs, as long as you just focus on these three things, one is pick an Australian shares ETF, like an established one. Pick a global shares ETF, an established one. And pick, I would, depending on your situation, pick some bonds, like a bond ETF. If you do those three things, that's 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 your base, that's your portfolio, that's your canvas to build on. You really don't need to go beyond that uh, unless you want to, and or as you get a bit further on, you probably will want to go beyond that when you establish your portfolio. But in the first instance, just pick one of those three. So find one in Australian shares, find one for global shares, find one for the defensive side, uh, or what we sometimes call bonds. And you will get a lot of diversification, which is that kind of secret source, diversification. You'll get a lot of that through ETFs because if you pick the right three ETFs, you'll probably get two or 300 shares in your Aussie, Aussie ETF. And then in your global ETF, you'll probably get at least 100, but probably 500 or a few thousand. And then if you go with your bonds, which is a different asset class or a different type of investment, you're going to get exposure to government bonds, which are issued by the government and are very safe. So that's diversification by asset class, by geography, and by individual companies. So you get a really good mix. In the past, you would have had to have, to your point about simplicity, you would have had to have bought 30 shares. Yeah. And if you talk to your grandparents, if they did invest, they would have had to choose each individual company in their portfolio. Yeah. They didn't have a thing access to things like ETFs and it was very hard for them to invest overseas as well. So a lot of them just focused on those large Australian companies that make up the top 10 holdings yeah, CSL, in your ETF these days. CBA, BHP, that's why they all talk about them. Because they probably did have 30 different investments, but those are the ones that they ended up buying because their broker put them onto them. There used to be an old rule we talked about on the show before amongst stockbrokers, which was the way that you would buy investments. Nowadays, you do it all online, obviously. Uh, and there was an old rule that stockbrokers used to have is called the race to 30. Just get to 30 individual stocks and you'll be diversified. Um, like obviously, that's not perfect because that doesn't mean you're diversified. If you just buy 30 lithium stocks and lithium falls, or if you buy 30 mining companies and mining falls, you're exposed to the same risk. But if you bought 30 different stocks from 30 different industries, you'd probably be pretty well diversified. But you don't need to do that as much anymore because you can just have three to five to 10 ETFs and you've got enough diversification to last your lifetime. Mm. And that's one of the things that is beautiful about ETFs. The other thing is like their transparency. You can go to the ETF provider's website like Vanguard, um, Globex, B3, 
beta shares, you can go to their website and you can see exactly what's inside the ETF. So in terms of transparency, it's probably something that hasn't always been there for the finance industry and it's finally there. Yeah. So done is better than perfect. You don't need the perfect strategy. It's not something you want to search for years and years and years before you start. Yeah. You just want to have an investment portfolio that does the job. Yeah. And you can slowly adjust over time as you learn, but it's more important to be invested. Absolutely it is. And um, one of the things that people struggle with when it comes to that picking an ETF, the analysis paralysis, um, there are so many to choose from, so how do you pick them? We've done episodes on that in the past. Uh, there were some great episodes actually that we did in the past. We did an ETF mini series. Where we actually broke down and helped you compare the top I think four or five biggest ASX 200-ish ETFs. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a really good episode. Um, but a lot of people, and oh, I've been dealing with this this past week actually, is people writing in and saying, hey, Owen, I noticed the U US stock market is really high now. I is the market about to crash? And there's 101, 101 reasons why I could tell you that that's not something that you should worry about. Um, of course, you will. Um, but the... The longer you've done this, the, the longer you do this, the, the more you realize that the stock market is going to crash and that's okay. Um, seeing your portfolio fall is normal. And one in every four years, it will go backwards and it could go backwards for a year or longer. So you've just got to be prepared for that. And if you mentally make that switch from, oh my God, the market's about to fall, I won't invest now, to the market's going to fall, but I know through my ETFs, I'm really well diversified and I plan to invest for 10 or 20 years, I'll be okay. It'll recover. Just look at any stock market and go 20-year share price chart and you'll see it in action. It goes down. But the further you get away from those crashes from 10 mm -hmm. years ago, the more those become little blips that you can't even notice. At the time, they seem real. But through the fullness of time, you realize that t trying to time the market is a, is a fool's errand. Yeah. And, um, and you, you don't Google need to. If you Google the Vanguard asset class chart, you can oh, yeah. see all of the different asset classes globally and how they've performed over the last 50 or 60 years. And you can see all those dips. And if you zoom in, you'll go, people were freaking out at the time when that dip happened. But if I zoom out over decades, it actually didn't mean anything. Yeah. It's just part of the journey. Yeah, absolutely it is. Like if you think about, so the Australian stock market has returned on average 13% over the past 124 years, we've had two world wars, Cold War, Vietnam, Korean War. Um, we've had different presidents, different prime ministers. Uh, we've had inflation, you know, in double digits. We've had interest rates at 17%. Um, that's all throughout that time, GFC, COVID, you know, global pandemic. We've had all of that and still the stock market's gone up. It doesn't go up every year but it does tend to go up over time. Now, I don't think 13% is reliable as an indicator for the future, um, but if you think about it, you don't just have the Australian stock market. If you own a few ETFs, you'll have the Australian, you'll have the US, you'll have some stocks from overseas, you'll have some bonds. So instantly, in the space of, if you've got your brokerage account set up, literally in the space of 10 minutes, you can have your portfolio exposed to the world through ETFs. And that is incredible to think. Whereas 10 years ago, even, you wouldn't have been able to do that nearly as easily. And so we've seen such uh, like a democratization of investing and in how it's done through ETFs. It's been really interesting to watch. And the best bit about it, Kate, is that you don't need a lot of money. You can start with uh, one of the platforms that offer you $50 investments, $100 investments, really simply. Yeah. But still a lot of people don't invest. And there's many reasons why. And some of the research we've looked at has shown that people believe they need more information. They believe they need more money. They believe they need to study it or do a certain course. But really, you just need to start taking action. And we've spoken about it before on the podcast, but there's a huge gap between knowing that I can be instantly diversified today if I open a brokerage account and buy a few ETFs. I've immediately got an investment portfolio. I'm diversified globally. There's a huge gap between knowing that and doing that. Yeah. Because I could just sit down and do it right now, but chances are I probably won't. And one of the things that's really important to focus on is taking action builds your confidence. A lot of us think that if I learn everything about investing, then I'll be ready to invest. 
but it doesn't happen that way generally for a lot of people. So how can you start taking small steps today to implement what you're learning about investing? It might be using a micro investing app like Raise or Pearl or Micro to get started. Mm. It might be just starting with one small ETF and buying a small position because you're using a fractional investing app like Sharesy. So just figuring out what is something I can do to start taking action today and that will build my confidence to be a longer-term investor. And you can figure out a lot of it as you go. You just need to start small yeah. is the, the lesson there. Don't just jump in with $20,000. Start with $5 mm. and then go to 50 and then go to 100 as you build your confidence. If you do have $20,000, then shout out, you can invest directly with Rask, just saying. Um, and there was a reason, Kate, that we'll, just, just on this, there's a reason that we launched with those three strategies, only three strategies that people can choose, is because we knew that three was the magic number. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, that's why we launched Rask Invest the way we did. But I want to... But you're keeping it simple. You're keeping it simple. You're focusing on how can I give people an investment solution that is simple and straightforward and doesn't unnecessarily overcomplicate things. Yeah. Trying to get people away from complexity is really hard in investing because people think you need to overcomplicate it. The investment industry basically tells you and shouts it at you that you should overcomplicate it. You should add these complex strategies, but you don't need to. Yeah. Even through the the charts that you see in your brokerage account, the, the red is trying to get your blood racing and trying to make you be emotional. So you trade. Oh, um, the so colours, the, color. the way the news, the newspapers, the media put red and green when it comes to investing and paint the picture of the world falling, even though the market just fell 1%. Yeah, they say billions of dollars, the law of large numbers, they get you bamboozled. So small bits lots of times is basically what you're saying. And I just did a really simple thing before where I chucked in into the Money Smart Compound Interest Calculator, which is a free calculator anyone can use. Um, and so I did $10,000 deposit up front. If you do have $10,000, we could put in zero, it doesn't really matter. Uh, a regular deposit of $500 a month, compounded annually or growing annually at 9%. Um, and then over 30 years is where I did this, that this is my time horizon. So if I have 10 grand, 500 bucks a month is what I can afford to add and I make a 9% return. After 30 years, you'll have $950,000, which is a huge amount of money. And think about your super is probably doing that for you if you work full time. Um, but you can do this on top of your super. If you remember the barefoot books from um, yesteryear, uh, he would advocate for 20% for future you. If you have a super, that's 10% plus this, that's 30%. You're saving even more than what uh, something like that would suggest. So you can make a lot of money. And one of the things that is the distinguishing feature of ETFs is that you don't have to worry about picking the stocks. You don't have to worry about when to sell necessarily. Um, you can build a great portfolio and you can just kind of prune it over time and just maintain it. Sure, you might make change from here to you know from here to the next 30 years and you might incur some tax if you sell or those types of things. But realistically, it can be as simple as just chip away at it, just add a little bit, just prune it as it grows and you'll have something that's absolutely wonderful in a couple of decades to come. And it's simple and it's transparent, and it's typically lower cost, and it's easy, like through your brokerage account. And you can do all of that starting today, like you said, through like sharesies, there's no minimum basically, uh, right up to some investment services that, you, that basically need you to have 20 grand to get started. You have everything from zero right through to whatever you want it to be to get started. It's pretty cool, and ETFs have facilitated a lot of that. But the crucial thing about that example you just gave, Owen, is the time frame. Yeah. 30 years. And for a lot of people, that is a long time. I mean, I'd say for everyone, that's a long time. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe people looking back over their life, they're like, where did the last 30 years go? But most of us are not really good at thinking long term and thinking about the next 30 years. So that can set you apart as an investor. If you can find ways to focus on long-term investing, to automate things, to set it up in the background so you're not thinking about it every day and to stay on track with your plan. You're going to be miles ahead of everyone else because so many people get stuck on the behavioral part of investing. They're so focused on what's the perfect strategy that they forget that they're not ready to deal with the ups and downs of investing and they can't stick it out and their goals change so quickly that they're just flipping around with their investment strategy every other day and they're not getting anywhere. So if you can think 
how can I be a long-term investor? That really sets you apart and that will help you achieve your goals. So mm. the compound interest calculator is a great, but you're going to have to work out how can you practically invest for 30 years? What yeah. m- mindset changes can you make? You have to make sure that the money that you're investing is not your everyday money. Uh, that's money that's for future you. But one of the things that's really fascinating that happens on this journey is you get most of the psychological benefit, in my opinion, in the first few years when your balance is smallest. After one year of this strategy, you will have 16900 So not that much, right? But if you think about where you are today, what would $16,000 do in your bank account? That would make you feel pretty good. Now, if we go to three years, you've got 32000 How would $32,000 make you feel? Starting to feel pretty good, right? But as you get a bigger and bigger balance, your life becomes easier financially because you're starting to earn dividends and you're starting to get passive income. However, the actual psychological benefit of it kicks in earlier than that. And that's really important to understand because if you really hate your job, if you're currently in credit card debt, if you're all of these things, you're going to feel amazing when you've got even $100 invested because you've gone from being a consumer of the economy to being an owner of it. And ETFs make that easy once you get that initial amount of money to get the ball snowballing down the hill. And after five years, you'll be able to say, I don't like my job anymore. I've got 100 grand behind me or 50 grand or whatever it is. I can afford to take two months off to find another job now because five years ago, I couldn't do that because I just was under so much pressure. And then by the time you reach $500,000 or a million dollars, it's so ingrained in your habits that you barely even notice that you've just become a millionaire. And that's what's really, really powerful about this is just starting the journey seems like you're not making any progress from a spreadsheet perspective, but from a psychological perspective, you're making huge progress. And that is such a wonderful spot to be in. And it changes to your identity too. So now that we've been investing for many years, we just think of ourselves as investors. It's not something we're actively going, oh, am I going to do something with my investments this month? Or is next month the month I start investing? It's just something we do in the background. So Mm. we do talk about it a bit more than the average person because of the podcast. But outside of this, we are really just focused on the other bits of life and what we're doing with our careers and our personal lives and our hobbies. And so investing doesn't take up all all of our time because we're keeping things simple. Yeah. And one of the final concluding thoughts we just tuck in here is that a lot of what's come with ETFs is a lot of automation in people's lives. You can automate money to invest. You can automate money to do X, Y, and Z. And that's been a huge unlocker for people because it means you don't have to stare at a brokerage account every day. You don't have to stare at whatever. You can literally just set it up and let it run in the background while you're living your life. You earn your income. The money splits um, via BPAY or via direct deposit into your investment. You know it's going into an ETF. Yeah, it's going to go down some days, but we've got more. And at the end of the day, at the end of 30 years, you could set this up today, work for the next 30 years, and it would just run by itself, which is absolutely wonderful. So that's the big change over the past 10 years of ETF investing is how people are using it, how they're putting that automation in place, um, and basically getting on with life. Yeah. And that's a, that's a wonderful thing. So it's been, it's been a hell of a 10 years for ETFs. Even the past five years has been incredible since COVID. Um, and it's just, there'll be just more of it to come. More ETFs, more money, more tools. Um, and hopefully, as long as you keep it simple, a keep better it outcome. simple, take action, small bits, lots of times. Yeah. More ETFs don't equal more diversification. So don't overcomplicate your strategy and patience. Yes. Critical some, part of the equation. Some good values there. If you do use ETFs, if you've invested in ETFs and you want to let us know what your first ETF was, let us know on social media. Send us a message on Twitter or X, Instagram, TikTok, wherever you get your social media, LinkedIn, doesn't matter. Let us know what ETF you first bought. Uh, it'd be wonderful to hear from you. If you have any questions for us on ETFs, you can send it in via the link in your show notes that says ask a question. And if this is the very first episode you've ever listened to about ETFs, we have plenty more where that came from. We have a free ETF investing course that'll get you over all the basics. And we also have an ETF investing mini series. So I'll link all of that in the show notes Mm -hmm. that will get you up to scratch with ETF investing. So you're ready to get started. Absolutely. No more WTF. What is an ETF? Uh, It is all happening. So it's an industry as like a whole for finance that is wonderful and it's doing great things. It's making investing easier, simpler, all those things. So 
get involved. You can start small and uh, there's plenty of resources to consume. Kate, heaps of fun. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks for watching this video on the RAS Network. While you're here, don't forget to like and subscribe so you can get videos each and every day on business, finance, investing, and so much more. Sometimes it can go for 20 minutes. One day he'll finish responding to emails and we'll start recording the podcast. And even if we start 20 minutes late, we'll still say something interesting. That was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs>